Hi, hello and welcome back to program analysis. This is the second video in the lecture on symbolic and concordic execution. And what we'll do in this uh, second part is to look into some of the challenges of symbolic execution. So in the previous video, I've introduced this idea of symbolic execution and we've seen that it can work pretty well um, on simple programs as the one that I've used in that video. But uh, we will now look into some challenges that occur when we're actually trying to apply this idea to larger programs. And we'll also see how these challenges can be addressed. So here's a list of five problems with um, classical symbolic execution, which I will briefly explain now, and then we will go through them uh, one by one. So problem one, number one is about loops and recursion. Because if you think about this execution tree that we've seen in the previous lecture, and if you try to draw this tree for say a program that has a loop, you'll quickly find out that actually this is an infinite um, execution tree and there's no way to really draw it. And also that means there's no way to really reason about all the paths in this, uh, in this tree. The second problem, even if you do not have this, um, you know, this infinity because of a loop, is that you may still have or will still have path explosion, which means that the number of paths in this tree is exponential in the number of conditionals. Um, and in a large program, you have a lot of conditionals, so this number of paths quickly reaches um, um, yeah, a, an order of magnitude that is just too large to completely uh, reason about. Yet another problem is about the environment in which a program is executing. So no program, no practically useful program is, um, is executing in isolation as the simple examples that um, I've been using in the first uh, video of this lecture. But instead, real programs typically deal with a lot of native calls, system calls, library calls, basically an environment of other parts of a larger um, uh, software system that also needs to be taken into consideration if you really want to reason about the behavior of a program. Then there's some limitation of these solvers. So we've seen that these SMT solvers um, can solve some complex um, equations, but um, we will see that there are also some limitations. For example, when it comes to uh, values that are um, expressed uh, or that, that, that are floating point values because um, most solvers cannot really handle floating point values um, that well. And finally, there's also a problem um, with programs that have complex structures on the heap. So typically data structures that consist of objects and pointers between these objects, because if you want to reason about those, you somehow need to have a way to map um, the properties of these, um, of these heap data structures into um, um, yeah, the constraints and formulas, logical formulas that are understood by the, by the SMT solvers and how to do this in a scalable way is actually not so easy. So after this quick walk through these five challenges, let's now have a look at the first two in some more detail and then let's also see how these challenges are typically addressed in practical tools that use symbolic execution. Let's start by illustrating the problem that um, occurs when your program has, for example, a loop. And let's just do this by looking at a very simple function. Let's call it f and it takes one argument, which I'll call a. And then what we do here in the function is to assign this argument a to local variable, say x. And then we have a while loop where we are checking whether x is positive. And as long as it is, we're going to decrement x. Okay, so it's a very simple function. Now, if you think about the execution tree of this, um, of this function, then we'll start with this um, initial edge here where we are assigning the initial symbolic values of a um, yeah, to, uh, to a. So a0 gets assigned to a. And then because of the um, first assignment, we also have the same value a0 assigned to x. Now we are reaching um, the first conditional in this execution where we are checking whether a0 is larger than 0. And of course, this check may return true or false. If it returns false, um, we are done because then we won't enter this while loop at all and the program um, is, is done. If it returns true, then we'll have this x minus minus statement here on this edge in the graph and then we'll reach again the conditional of the loop. And now because x has been decremented, 
Um, this check that x is larger than zero actually means that we are checking whether a zero minus one is larger than zero. And then again, we can have the two possible outcomes, true and false. If it's false, we are done. But if the outcome is true, we will again execute x minus minus and then um, reach the loop condition another time where we are now checking whether a zero minus two is larger than zero. And then as you can hopefully see now, this um, goes on and on and on like this, because down here we can have infinitely many more of these executions because we simply do not know what the initial value of a is. So now that we've understood the problem, the question is what can we do about it? And um, the solution is typically to not try to reason about the entire execution tree and maybe to not even represent the entire execution tree in memory, simply because this would uh, exhaust all memory and you still wouldn't be able to fit an infinitely large tree into it but instead to build the tree um, step by step and to heuristically select which of the branches that we have not yet explored to explore next. And now the, um, the heuristic to choose which branch to explore next um, can, be, can be many different things. So the most simple one is to just select one at random. So you look at all the branches that we have not yet expanded further and just pick one of them at random and explore it. Um, another option is to do this selection based on coverage. So if you uh, have some reason to believe that if you would um, explore this branch more, you would probably cover more code, maybe because you've never executed that branch, um, then this is maybe a good um, a branch to explore next. Yet another option is to prioritize branches based on their distance to some interesting program location. So sometimes you have some locations that you know would be interesting to reach for example, assertions or maybe calls to particular APIs. And in that case, you can compute a distance, for example, in terms of how many branches um, you are still away from this program location, and then prioritize those branches that are likely to bring you closer to your interesting location. And finally, um, there's also the option to interleave symbolic execution with random testing. So maybe if you have um, tried some of the above heuristics for a couple of executions and somehow the program doesn't really make more progress or it just takes too long because symbolic execution tends to take relatively long, then you take the existing inputs that you have and maybe give them to a fuzzer, which will then mutate them in a more random way as we've seen in the last lecture. And then once you've done this and maybe covered some more code and some more parts of this execution tree, you're then going back to symbolic execution and try to explore some more branches in a more systematic way. So these are all different ways of addressing this problem of a large or maybe infinitely large execution tree. And it um, none of these heuristics really solves the problem in the sense that they magically help you to um, explore the entire tree, but they are all ways to address that problem in practice. So going back to this overview of these five problems, um, what we've just seen is basically different ways to address the first two problems, the problem of loops and recursion and the path explosion, which basically all boil down to having a very large or maybe infinitely large execution tree. Let's now have a look at this um, problem number three, which is about the environment. And specifically, we will here look into um, how a program can interact with a file system um, while still being executed um, through, uh, yeah, or analyzed through symbolic execution. So the key problem here is that a program may actually have some behavior that depends on some part of a more complex system that just cannot be analyzed um, by symbolic execution. For example, this could be some native API. So let's say you have um, a symbolic execution tool that reasons about JavaScript code, but sometimes it's calling a native API that is uh, implemented not in JavaScript, but in say C++ and then compiled to native code. Um, then your tool that works for JavaScript just can't analyze um, the, um, this native API. Um, an even more challenging problem is if your code is interacting with the network because then you're basically leaving the current computer and um, your behavior depends on some other computers. So you in principle would have to run symbolic execution across different computers, which in principle is feasible, but in practice is pretty hard. Or um, you may have the problem that your program is accessing the file system, is maybe reading something from the file system, and then the behavior depends on what was read um, um, from the file system. And this is also the problem that is illustrated down here with this simple example where we have some JavaScript code that uses this FS module to read from the file system. 
So we are reading a particular file um, stored somewhere in a file called um, yeah, foo.txt here. And then depending on the content of this file, we are entering this branch or not. And now um, if you just um, look at the symbolic execution idea that we've seen so far, it's not clear how a symbolic um, execution engine should actually um, reason about what is read from the file system. So one popular way of um, handling this challenge is to model the environment in some way that is somewhat representative for the real environment in which a program is executing, but still um, allows a symbolic execution engine to, to reason about the code. So one such um, approach is implemented in a tool called CLI, which is one of the most popular symbolic um, execution tools out there, which models, in this case, um, the file system. It does it in two possible ways. If you're interacting with the file system and all arguments um, of this um, API calls that you're doing are concrete, so you basically know what their values are, well, then you can just forward um, this to the actual operating system. So this is um, the first case mentioned here, where, for example, if you go back to the previous example, if you would read from this file name, and this file name is a concrete value because it's given as a string literal here, then it would just look up this file on the file system and actually return whatever this file is returning. The second case um, is where some of the arguments that go into these um, file system APIs are symbolic. So you do not really know, for example, what file is read. And what um, CLI does in this case is to um, model um, the call by basically emulating a file system that looks a bit like a real file system and does something that a real file system could do, but it's not really the actual file system, but it's just an imaginary system of symbolic files, which CLI makes sure to look like a real file system, but, but it's not mapped down to the, to the actual um, disk that your computer has. And now the goal um, here is to explore all possible legal, legal interactions that um, the program could have with the file system by maybe making this file system act sometimes like this and sometimes like that. So as a concrete example, let's say um, CLI, which is actually not implemented for JavaScript, but let's assume something like this would be implemented for JavaScript. So in this case, let's say we again um, read a file using this fs.readfilesync API. Then there would be some implementation of this method in, for example, JavaScript that doesn't really read from the actual file system, but models the effects that doing that would have for some symbolic file name. And if you then read the same file again, it would return you the same content, even though there actually isn't, um, isn't such um, a file on your actual file system. So now this gives you an idea of one way of addressing this challenge of uh, a program that interacts with the environment. Um, but as we've seen, this is only for the file system and it's somewhat limited and, for example, doesn't address the problem of interacting with some other native APIs. And in the next um, video of this lecture, what we'll do is to look at um, an approach that addresses the last three problems here all at once using um, a very simple idea, which is to mix symbolic execution and concrete execution so that whenever the symbolic execution doesn't really know how to continue, we fall back on concrete execution, but then also go back to symbolic execution if we can. We'll see how exactly uh, this combination of concrete and symbolic execution works in the next video of this lecture. What you have already learned in this video is what challenges actually exist when you try to apply this idea of symbolic execution to real uh, programs. And you've seen um, some of the approaches that are used to address these challenges, in particular this idea of not exploring the entire tree, but of heuristically selecting which branches are most interesting to explore next. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.